Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. Uh, Eleanor Grix here again. Uh, this presentation is going to give you information on how to read the label accompanying works of art. Um, you are going to be tested on these skills on your first test, which remember you get two attempts for. Uh, to clarify, you're not going to be tested on these specific works of art that I'm going to show you, but rather the skills that I'm going over here. How to find the title of a work of art, how to understand what the medium is, what the subject is, the dates the art was created, and so forth. So um, I'll try and be brief. I tend to sort of talk a lot whenever I get in front of a camera. Um, I'm also going to attach these informational slides below as a downloadable PDF, just in case you don't really have time to watch this whole thing. But let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to minimize myself here, and I'm going to pull up your textbook and this handy little presentation that I've made. All right, <clears throat> how to read the label for a work of art and why it's important. Uh, the two most important terms uh, that are in your first test are medium and subject. Medium means what the art is made of, the materials and technique used to create the work of art. Uh, and subject is simply put, what it is a work of art depicting. The subject of the art is what the art depicts. So first let's look at medium. Again, that's a material along with its technique. For example, a technique used to make art would include painting, sculpture, photography, filmmaking, etc. Media is the more specific material used in that technique. So, for example, painting. You wouldn't say, look at this painting by Monet. It's a painting. You would say that it is an oil painting or perhaps a watercolor painting. These are media used in painting. Similarly, if you're looking at a sculpture, medium means what the sculpture is made of marble, granite, bronze, etc. And this is important to understand because the techniques used in making a fresco are very different than making an oil painting, even though they're both painting. Similarly, you don't work with bronze the same way you work with marble. They are both types of sculpture, but the media and the technique used are very different. So again, medium is what the art is made of, Subject is what the art depicts. This is kind of a wordy slide. I'll let you read it at your pace, but it's what is uh, what the art depicts. Is it a portrait, a landscape? It is, a, is it a painting depicting a scene from history or a still life? The subject is what the art depicts if it is representational, meaning not abstract. Okay, I also want to talk about titles. Okay, so the example that I'm going to be using is image 21.1 in your text. So whenever you navigate in your textbook uh, and I say, what is, uh, who is the artist for image 21.1, you can search for it here and pull it up. The first thing I like to point out is something that really bugs me about your textbook. It makes a mistake with titles. God knows why, but it presents the titles in all caps. That bugs the heck out of me. Within the text, the title is presented correctly. Um, titles are always presented, this is important, in italics, and they should follow standard proper noun capitalization rules. I like to point this out because if you're going to be writing, say, a paper on a work of art, Make sure that you present the title correctly in italics, not in all caps, which is what your book does. I don't know why. At least your e-text does. Your printed copy of the book actually does it right, uh, presenting the title correctly in italics in standard upper and lower case. But whatever. Titles of works of art are presented in italics. Got it? Good. So let's look some more at the information. All right, here's how to read a label. The information is presented in this order. First, it gives you the artist's name, in this case, Jacques-Louis David. 
The title of the piece, again, needs to be in standard capitalization in italics. The title is The Oath of the Orati. Sometimes after that, it'll give you a location. And actually, let me uh, just scroll down a little bit in your textbook to show you a work of art where that is the case. Uh, Thomas Jefferson's home, Monticello. Monticello is the name of the structure. Where is it located? Charlottesville, Virginia. You can see that some works of art have a given place in case it's in a fixed location, like a piece of architecture or, say, a work of art that's in a church. Let's go back to that painting. All right, so no location is given here because it's not fixed, it's just a painting. The date, that's when the piece was made, 1784. The medium is given next. This is oil on canvas. This is a pretty standard medium. You're going to see a lot of this, meaning this is a painting. It is made of oil paint on a canvas support. Canvas is a type of fabric, as opposed to, say, oil on panel, like the Mona Lisa. All right, after the medium, we're given dimensions. This is how large the work of art is. Dimensions are given in height and then width. Sometimes it also gives us depth if it's a three-dimensional work of art. This work of art is 10 feet tall by 14 feet wide. All right, now after that, this is information that's not necessarily relevant to you, which is uh, the credit information. Uh, many times works of art are in the location of large museums, in this case the Musée de Louvre in Paris. And then after that, you're given credit information, the people who perhaps photographed the work. Again, to come back here, um, right, uh, this work of art can be found in the Royal Academy of Arts in London, and the person who took the photograph of this work of art was John Hammond. Make sure that you don't conflate that information with the artist of the piece. Angelica Kaufman is the artist of this work of art. This is just the name of the man who took the picture. Again, not really relevant to you. So if you were to write about this work of art, make sure that you don't say like, "Ooh, I love this painting by John Hammond. He is not the artist. Angelica Kaufman was. All right, now let's move on to subject. What is this a painting of? A whole bunch of people in a room. The title is uh, Oath of the Orati. Uh, the subject of this work of art is a story from Roman legend, uh, the Oath of the Horatius Brothers, something you might need to look up to fully understand the piece. All right, so that's how you read a label. Artist, title, date, medium, dimensions. That's the relevant information for you. Just uh, to also be thorough, um, if you were to come across a work of art in a museum or perhaps on a museum website, you might be given more information, um, especially the nationality of the artist and dates following them. That is the artist's dates of birth and death. Um, we're still given the title in italics, the date, and the medium, dry point on paper. Uh, and on that score, let me bring something up real quick. Dry point. You've probably never heard of that before. Here's a work of art in your textbook that was also made with dry point, image 8.11. So in case you're looking at a work of art and you don't understand what the medium is, let me show you something. If you double click on it, go to search selection, and it'll actually pull up the definition of that medium right here in that window. Very helpful if you don't perhaps understand what uh, the medium is or a particular vocabulary term like still life. Here's the definition of what an engraving is. It's a very helpful process if you're not 100% sure how a piece was made. So this work of art, for example, is a print, not a drawing, but a print, because as you can see, this is a printmaking process. Anyway, back to my presentation. Right, so this is a work of art that I saw at the Jepson Center here in town. Uh, the artist is Dame Laura Knight. The title is Juanita. It was made in 1928. It's a print made of dry point. 
And below that is accession information. Uh, again, not really relevant to you or to this class. All right, so that's the basic uh, how to of how to read a label and how to get information that's going to be used on your test. Uh, allow me to go over uh, some common mistakes because whenever people write about works of art, they tend to just look at the image and not read the label information. And I want to make sure that you um, avoid these common mistakes. A lot of times people don't understand what the medium is. Um, some t I tend to read a lot of papers where people call every single work of art a painting or a photo. So make sure you get the medium correct. Sometimes people misidentify the artist, as I said, uh, using the credit information instead of the artist information. Sometimes there's confusion about dates. We'll go over some of those common mistakes here. Sometimes people don't understand the subject of a work of art, which is fine. Sometimes you might have to look up a work of art if you're not familiar with it. And again, with subject, people sometimes tend to call every single painting a portrait when it's not. Also, overlooking the dimensions. Make sure you make note of all of these bits of information whenever you write about a work of art. All right, so let's start with this piece here. So the artist is Maurice Quentin de la Tour. The title is Self-Portrait. Let's take a look at the medium. What's the medium of this piece? Pastel on paper. Now, you might have to look that up. What are pastels? Pastels are drawing media, kind of like crayons or chalks. This work of art is a drawing. I, I would tend to get papers where people say things like, ooh, I love this painting by De La Tour. This is not a painting. This is a drawing executed in pastels. Now, what's the subject of this piece? It says self-portrait. Well, as I've said, a portrait is a work of art that depicts a person. A self-portrait means that it is a portrait of the artist made by that artist. So who is this man in this drawing? It's this guy, the artist, Maurice Quentin de la Tour, because this is a self-portrait. As opposed to, say, this portrait by Raphael. So continuing with what is the subject of a work of art, Subject is what the work of art depicts. And many times, especially with older works of art, the title gives us the subject. The subject of this work of art is a man, specifically Baldassare Castiglione. Again, that's the subject of the piece. He is not the artist. The artist is Raphael, one name only, by the way. So don't write something like, what a beautiful portrait by Castiglione. That's incorrect. Castiglione is the subject of the portrait, not the artist. The artist is Raphael. The artist in this piece is Paul Cézanne. The title of the piece is Still Life with Apples, and that's also the subject. A still life is a work of art that depicts stationary objects. Again, many times the title is the subject. The subject of this piece is a church in the town of Auvers. The subject of this piece is the crucifixion. And if you're at all familiar with Christian subjects, you probably understand what's happening in this piece. If you are completely unfamiliar with the Bible, you probably wouldn't understand who this person is nailed onto a wooden cross. But if you're familiar with the Bible, you understand what a crucifixion is and who these people are and what's happening. Again, that's the subject. It's what the art depicts. And again, many times the title will give us a clue, uh, but sometimes even when the title does give us a subject, you might still need to look a few things up. Let's look at this first piece by Peter Paul Rubens. The title is The Judgment of Paris. Now, whenever you hear Paris, you probably think of the city in France, but that's not what this painting is about. Paris is a person, uh, and the judgment would mean uh, he is judging a sort of a beauty contest between these three women. So again, the judgment of Paris has nothing to do with the city in France. You would have to perhaps look that up to understand the story behind the piece. Similarly here, 
the subject of the piece, as indicated by the title, Luther before the diet of worms. Diet of worms. It makes you think of someone who's going to eat earthworms. That's not the subject of the piece, of course. Uh, Luther here refers to Martin Luther, the monk who is going to be excommunicated by the Roman Catholic Church. A diet um, refers to a particular meeting or sort of like a council, and Worms is a city in Germany. So if you were to write a paper on this work of art, you might need to look up a bit of historical information to understand what Luther before the Diet of Worms means. Even though the title gives us a subject, we still have to do a little bit of digging. And we also might have to use a bit more imagination. Again, sometimes the titles will give us a subject, but occasionally titles are a bit more poetic. The title of this piece is Take Your Son, Sir. Uh, the subject of the work of art is a woman holding an infant. Again, subject is what the art depicts. The subject of this work of art is an African-American woman with two children. The title is Forever Free. The title of this piece is The Birthday. And the subject is two people in an interior who are kissing. The subject of this work of art is a soldier. This is a painting about post-traumatic stress and the horrors and strain of soldiers in wartime. The title of the piece is The 2,000 Yard Stare. Again, the subject is what the art depicts. The title sometimes helps us with that. So make sure you understand that. All right, here's a piece by artist Veronesi. The title of the piece is Feast in the House of Levi, meaning the subject. This is biblical. You might have to look up a Bible verse in order to understand the scene that's happening here. But what I like to point out here is how big the painting is. Look. That one tick mark, that means feet. Two tick marks means inches. This piece is 18 feet, 4 inches tall, by 42 feet, 6 inches tall. That is a very, very large painting, and that's actually pretty impressive. And actually, I kind of forgot to point that out. That's also the case here. One tick mark, feet, 2 inches. This piece is 10 feet tall, almost 11 feet tall. It's pretty impressive. And that's something that you wouldn't really understand unless you looked at the piece in person. And since that's probably not an option, unless you happen to make your way to Venice, make sure that you observe the dimensions of the piece. I also want to make sure you understand the dates of works of art, when the piece was made. So let's break down this piece here. This is a painting from Thebes, Egypt. Uh, painted on the walls of Nebamun's tomb. When was this piece made? 1450 BCE. BCE, what does that mean? Right, so you probably grew up learning dates as BC and AD. BC stands for before Christ. AD stands for Anno Domini, not after death. Anno Domini means the year of our Lord. But you're not going to see those terms in your book. Instead, you're going to see the terms BCE and CE. That means before the Common Era and Common Era. It means the same thing as BC and AD. These are just the terms that you're now going to be seeing in your textbook and in academia in general. When was this piece made? 1450 BC, or in today's terminology, before the Common Era, BCE. Hopefully that's not confusing. Another thing to point out is that little C in front. What does that mean? That stands for circa. That's Latin. It means approximately or around. When was this piece made? Mm, approximately 1450 BCE. But notice something that's missing in this title information. No artist. Many times it's because the artists are unknown, whether because it's too old 
or perhaps because it was from a time or culture where the artist just wasn't acknowledged. We're not given every single bit of information on every piece. The artist in this piece is not provided. We do have the title, which is also a description, Crisis Photographer with Marian Saints. Now take a look at the medium. It's a mosaic. Again, you may need to look it up. Uh, a mosaic is a work of art made by gluing tiny little tiles to the wall. Um, I've read papers where people will say, ooh, what a lovely photograph. I really admire the skill in this photo. I mean, I guess it is a photograph of a mosaic, but it's incorrect to evaluate this work of art as photography. It's a mosaic. We're also given the location here because this is a work of art that's in a fixed place, specifically the Cathedral of Monreale in the island of Sicily near Italy. But take a look at the date. It says late 12th century. Okay, the 12th century, that's the 1100s, 1100 to 1199. This piece was made in the late 12th century, meaning it was made in the late 1100s. So you're going to see dates in your textbook presented as centuries, 19th century, early, early 20th century, 15th century BCE. Whenever you talk about centuries, you kind of have to go back one. So for example, the 20th century, is 1900 to 1999. Whenever you see that a work of art was made in the early 19th century, that means the early 1800s, not 1900s. 19th century is the 1800s. The 21st century is the century that we're in now, which is 2000 to 2099. So it just takes a little bit of getting used to. So again, this is a mistake I sometimes read in essays. The people saying this was made in the late 1200s, that's incorrect. Late 12th century is the 1100s because we start with the first century, which is up to year 99. I know it takes a little getting used to, so I guess get used to it. Let's take a look at this piece by Donatello. Again, Donatello is the artist's name. What's the title of the piece? David as in David and Goliath. The subject of this work of art is from the Bible. Make sure you don't say things like, wow, what a beautiful sculpture by David. David is not the artist. Donatello is the artist. The medium is bronze. This is a sculpture. It's made in bronze. The dimensions, 62 inches high. You might need to look that up. This piece is about five foot three inches. But what I wanted to point out is the date. We see the little C that stands for circa, followed by a date range. In this case, that means this work of art was made sometime in this five year period, circa 1425 to 1430. It doesn't mean that this work of art took five years to make. It means it was made sometime within this range. Dates are often presented in ranges. But compare this date to this date, which is presented as 1855 to 1864, meaning this piece took nine years to make. Let's look a bit more at the title information. The artist is Richard Dadd, and the title is The Fairy Feller's Master Stroke. This is an oil painting that's 21 inches high by 15 inches wide. Actually very small for a painting. And yes, this man spent nine years working on this piece. It was begun in 1855 and completed in 1864, a period of nine years. Uh, the subject of the work of art is kind of complicated. It's a garden with a bunch of little fairies dancing and reveling around in it. And it becomes kind of interesting whenever you think of someone spending nine years on this obsessive amount of detail. So you might go look it up and you learn things like the artist painted this while he was actually being tra treated for mental illness in, a, in an asylum, which is a true story, by the way. 
again, I'm getting off topic, but this is why you should always read the label. You get interesting pieces of information and clues to the uh, artist's intent. Like in this piece by Francisco Goya. The title is in Spanish. It translates to, There is nothing to be done. I wanted to point out that this work of art is from a series. The Disasters of War is the name of a series of images by Francisco Goya. This is number 15 of that series. So the title of this work of art is, And There is Nothing to be Done. The title is not Disasters of War. That's the name of the collection of images. I also would like to point out the medium of the piece, etching, dry point, burin, and burnisher. I bet you don't know any of those words, which is okay. That's why I showed you how to look it up. But suffice it to say, this work of art is a print, and it really tends to get me insane whenever people say things like, ooh, I love this drawing by Goya, and I just want to reach through the screen and give them a smack. It's not a drawing. It's a print. And before you're like, ease up, Grix, it looks like a drawing. It could be a drawing. Well, yes, it could be a drawing. But the fact that it's a print is very important because that means that this is a multiple image. Prints are meant to be reproduced. There's meant to be hundreds and thousands of copies of this work of art because Francisco Goya wanted lots of people to see it. Knowing that this is a print and not a drawing is an integral part of understanding the artist's intent. And that's why I made this big long presentation about how to read a label and understand that information. Because if you just stopped at the image, you would lose some of the interest of art. Look at this piece by Fabian Pena. Uh, the subject of the art, it's a skull. This is an image of a skull. That's the subject, not very interesting. But if you were to write a paper saying, oh, this drawing by Fabian Pena or this painting by Pena, no, no, it's not a drawing. It's not a painting. It's not a photograph. It's not digital art. What is the medium of this piece, ladies and gents? It's made of cockroach wing fragments. This man cut up tiny little cockroach wings to make this piece. It's awful and amazing. I think it's awesome, this work of art. And now my mind is filled with questions. How? Why? Where do you get the bugs? Um, you start to get really interested in a work of art whenever you don't just look at the image, but you also look at how the artist made it and when they made it. And you might look up more information about the artist. This guy works in very unusual media and is very famous for his mosaics that are made entirely of the wings of discarded insects. It's ghastly and amazing. And it's things that you would only know if you paid attention to label information. So make sure that you don't just look at the image, read the label as well. And again, this is information that I expect you to review on your first test. Good luck.